Welcome to Opinion Nation. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an ideal that all of us are created equal. I, too, am America. Now, here's your host, Bryce Robbins. Hello, everybody. I'm Bryce Robbins, host of Opinion Nation on this pretty lovely Saturday morning. As always, when it's Opinion Nation, it's pretty always sunny out in lovely New Jersey. Today's topic, however, is about small government or big government. As you can tell by the title of the show, big or small. So... I have a guest, two guests actually today. Um, that's going to be we're going to be talking about the size of government. Uh, but this whole topic was started because I found this video on this website called Turning Point USA. So I'm just going to play a quick clip for you from it, and then we're going to go right to my guests to start up the debates, the conversation. So here, listen to this clip. I believe firmly that this generation can be and will be won over by our set of ideas. We're kind of at a turning point in this country. If you all said I started an organization, Turning Point USA, two and a half years ago, around two key values, free markets and limited government. What we're looking at is the most independent generation in America. And young people all across the country are looking for an alternative point of view. They're sick and tired of big government telling them how to live their life. They're struggling under the burden of student loans. They can't find jobs. They're sick of the government reading their text. All right, so I'm going to leave it there. The part where I kind of got confused is that big government is telling us how to live our lives, yada, yada, yada. So we're just going to go to my guest, Henry, who is, well, on the conservative point of view. And we're going to be talking about what role government should really be playing in our lives. So, Henry, why don't we start off with your point of view on the where government should stand, I guess would be my first question. How big, ideally, is your government? Uh, well, to put it in uh, a nominal context, I think measuring the size of a government is essentially impossible. If I were to give more of a, a qualitative description of my ideal government, it would be that uh, the role of government uh, during peacetime should only be to ensure that its citizens are safe and that their liberties, uh, rights, and property are protected. Any sort of interference in the social structure of their nation uh, should be best avoided, and any sort of overextension by a government should be uh, uh, dampened. Fair enough. So now, you know... I look at the idea when they say, oh, big government is, you know, totalitarian and Stalin and whatever. But I look at it and see, you know, whenever the government seemed to expand, so to speak, notably under FDR, uh, we see millions and millions of people are lifted out of poverty. Social Security under the Johnsons, Medicare and Medicaid brought people health care, the Affordable Care Act, all these things coming from government. Right. We, We saw that. That private business and laissez-faire, which never worked in this country, never worked. So I guess when you hear, you know, freer markets, freer people, does that hold true? Uh, no, and I'm not about to commit that fallacy, which I, which I consider to be completely and totally wrong by saying that a laissez-faire system of capitalism will ever work. And uh, I think the fact that people... Unfortunately, people on my side of the aisle uh, argue in favor of such a system. I, of course, there have been great strides made with government intervention. And as I said, uh, government's job should be in the protection of life, liberty, and uh, quote-unquote the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of property. Uh, in these contexts, the goal of government is to protect people. And in the certain case of the economy, it is, the, it is their goal to protect people against uh, an over overly capitalistic uh, system. What, what do you mean overly capitalistic? I, I'm a little confused what you meant by that. Okay. Uh, what I mean to say is that in a, in a sense of a perfectly laissez-faire capitalist system, there, of course, there are going to be people who are exploited, people who are trampled upon by big business. And I believe that one of the... One of the... Uh, 
one of the most important jobs of government is to be the the arbiter between capitalism and large corporations and the people and small business in the sense that they stop govern or them sorry they stop large corporations from becoming much too uh, involved in people's lives. All right, so let's go and look at uh, I guess instances of where do you think we can cut the size of government because uh, I mean I get the vibe that you're not into the you know uh, we we both know our friend Roberto has the sticker big government equals big problems I disagree <laughs> so uh, on your standpoint on this you know where do we cut government uh, I think that where we can cut government wouldn't necessarily be in the sense of any sort of uh, budget, although I do certainly believe that government's budget should be slashed in any number of ways and quite viciously at that. Uh, I believe that it's much more of a, a qualitative measure, again, of how we could cut back on government. For example, uh, there should be very, very minimal legislation over such things as uh, uh, Oh, a good example would be a pertinent example would be marriage. For example, uh, I, I myself am in favor of allowing gays to get married. I think most people are, and everyone should be. However, I don't think that this should be a matter which the government has the prerogative to interfere with. Let marriage stay among the people, and I, that's just one example, of course. But in cases of uh, social constructs, in cases of uh, social consequences, these should be left best to the social sphere rather than having Congress make a law about how we should treat people. So what about the, uh, I, I, I would agree there, and I was going to say that the only place where government should be small is in relation to social you know, points of view. So marriage, completely get out of the marriage game. Get out of a woman's vagina. Get out of <laughs> things. I mean... I agree there. There we can cut the size of government, sure. But when it comes to protecting the people from, you know, uh, corrupt banks, you know, the the uh, organization that Obama and Hillary Clinton set up, the uh, what's it called, uh, the uh, uh, Protection Bureau, the um, some type of Protection Bureau, a Consumer Protection Bureau. That to me is not big government. Dodd Frank is not big government. It's a it's more regulation over an unregulated industry. And to me, that just is there for the safety of our society. Now, how do you feel about that? Uh, how do I feel about government-funded or government-created organizations to act to as regulate, intermediary? To regulate, to regulate very big industries that risk harming our nation. We talk about national security. Well, banks being as big as they are is a threat to our national security as far as I'm concerned. So... This notion that, oh, big government is going to uh, – is getting in the way of the free market, what do you think about that when it's in relation to specifically big industries at risk of potential collapse? Uh, well, sure, and I'm going to actually go off uh, on a bit of a tangent here since you've brought up the big banks. Henry, you know you're always welcome to do that on my <laughs> Oh, I'm always welcome to go off on a tangent. Yeah, Um uh, I would actually like to kind of amend that and I add on something else, which is that, of course, we all know in the 2008 financial crisis, in the case of the big banks, uh, I find myself inordinately agreeing with people like Bernie Sanders and his followers in saying that uh, bailouts are equally as wrong as not – or sorry, bailouts are equally as bad as regulating capitalism to the sense that they are hindering it. Uh, if we were to take a – if we were to at least analyze what I think is a perfect system of capitalism, it is one which the consumer is certainly protected. You know, uh, the Consumer Protection Bureau does its job and does it relatively well. Or, for example, the Securities and Exchanges Commission or Securities Exchange Commission, uh, in which case we stop people from unsavory business practices that will default people and, uh, you know, uh, disenfranchise other people in business. Uh, I think that these things are equally as important as government taking themselves out of the capitalist system, taking themselves out of the economy, and making it so that government only protects the people and doesn't affirm or deny uh, our our market economy. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean that that point. Uh, 
I guess, kind of goes in step with what I'm stating. So I guess I, I, I don't really have anywhere to debate on that. That just makes sense. But now when we move into the aspect of healthcare, because that has been obviously under government growth uh, in sense of control, right? Under the Affordable Care Act, government has evidently grown its hand over our healthcare system. Is that negative? 18 million more people are under health insurance. Now, what's your point? I know I have my points of view on what's bad about it, but what's your point of view on on that aspect, the notion that government is growing its control over health care. Uh, in that sense, I would say that uh, I'm inclined to, to disagree with the motives and the execution, especially of the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of its motives, I find that a, it has been shown that even with the Affordable Care Act, more people have, have – still opted to use their own private health care providers. People still uh, trust them more, and they're much more stable. And this leads into execution, in which case uh, the ACA, Obamacare, really hasn't completely fulfilled its function. And we can see even examples in other countries. I know that you will be very ecstatic to hear me mention, uh, for example, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, in saying that while they do have public provided health care, uh, the fact of the matter is that its economic side and even the healthcare side don't much measure up to what we can provide in the United States. And I believe that this is this is endemic to allowing government to meddle in healthcare. So, so I guess what you're stating is more or less that our government system is still better. Our healthcare system, excuse me, is still better than theirs. Uh, is that correct? Right. Oh, absolutely. Having having traveled extensively to any number of countries around the world, I can affirm that uh, I would rather be flown back to a hospital in New York than one in, in France. Fair enough. But the notion that more people are now having access to... I always hear this argument, oh, you're going to have to wait longer for health care. I, I don't buy that because at the end of the day, we're not socializing medicine here, even though that's been proven it would save millions of dollars. We're not doing that. We are still leaving it up to a market-based, you know, insurance-based system under the Affordable Care Act. So that's one of my big problems with it is that when I hear, oh, there's 18 million more people insured, that's also 18 million more customers to line the pockets of the freaking insurance companies. But again, that's neither here nor there. Um, but I'm just trying to focus here on the size of government. So when government says, to, you know, this is the next topic I really wanted to jump to with you. Under... Obama, he enacted the Clean Power Plan, which effectively is going to kill coal in the future. It, it is going to eradicate the virus I call coal. And it is going to make it ineffective, uh, inefficient, and monetarily impossible to construct a coal-fired power plant in this country if it goes through fully. It's still in the works. My question to you is, does government have the right to regulate an industry such as the coal industry? Uh, I believe so, but I believe that it should be very, very case by case. I won't make the generalization that all of a certain type of business or all of business should be closely watched by government. For example, uh, a craft store shouldn't have to be registered with 13 government bureaus before they can sell a, a sheet of fabric. However, I will say in the case of such industries as coal, uh, there is a distinct reason and, and I can see absolutely the ration behind such uh, a regulation. Uh, obviously, we can agree that it's, it's primarily environmental, which I, I completely support. I believe that it falls into the same category as uh, is government meddling with paper producing companies for stopping them from hacking down the national parks. And in that case, I can support a government action because I know that what they are doing is objectively correct, defending the environment in which we live. In the case of... Oh, I'm sorry. Please. No, no, no. Continue your point. It's fine. Uh, In the case of such industries as, say, uh, financial institutions where their purpose and their morality is far more abstract... I think that we must uh, 
we must analyze whether or not our government takes action against or for them uh, on a very, very, very minute scale. So I turn back to this group, Turning Point USA, because that's really what inspired today's uh, show about big government, small government. And I see all these things. Oh, big government sucks. You know, uh, students have been hurt by big government. Uh, we're sick of government in our lives. But my question again is, where is the big government that is hurting our lives? Do, do you have any you know examples that you can share of big government hurting your life? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I've never particularly felt like uh, Big Brother was watching me in my lifetime. Uh, I can understand sort of – I can understand where people see where government may be overbearing in nature. Uh, for example, uh, cake makers in Wyoming who don't want to sell their cakes to a gay couple that's getting married and the government forces them to. In cases like this, I can see – a rallying cry form around that in the case of, or in the sentiment of government is trampling our rights, government is becoming far too involved in our lives. And in certain scenarios like that, I can understand their sentiment. However, in my personal experience, I think in the experience of a great many Americans, we don't much experience the sort of uh, intervention in our lives by government as would be seen in the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. And so I think that when my fellow conservatives make the argument that, you know, government is, is breaking down our door and coming into our homes and, and absorbing our lives in almost the same sentiment as our founding fathers protested quartering, uh, I find it to be a bit overbearing, perhaps even hyperbolic. Are, and let me ask you this. Are you, are you comfortable with Donald Trump as <clears throat> your next president? Uh, I can say that in a, in a country domineered by Donald Trump, I would feel far more insecure with regards to the government, much, much to the contrary of what I've just said. No, it's, it, it, it's really interesting because we talk about how, oh, we hate big government or the Repu Republicans do, how they hate big government. But they just elected a guy who's going to make the government probably bigger than ever, uh, badder than ever. I mean, for God's sakes, we're going to deport 11 million people? That is a little bit of government overreach right there, I would say. Would you not? Oh, sure. I'll completely agree. I mean, we see even throughout history, uh, not to, of course, uh, bash the dead or to bash a great leader, but we see in the traditional conservative uh, demigod of Ronald Reagan, he raised government spending by – a greater margin than any other president had done in American history. We see s incredible increase in the size of government and the scope of government under Republican Congresses and other Republican presidents. And I believe that in this sense, there is a great hypocrisy amongst the Republican Party, perhaps not conservatives as a, as a movement, but certainly amongst the Republican Party. So that, where does this idea come from then? That the Republicans are big government is is bad government when in all reality government and you can look at the facts government has grown drastically under republicans under bush under bush senior under reagan the government grew government spending grew so where where do we get this idea that republicans are the party of small government well i think it's generated from the well number one it's generated from their rhetoric in which they assure their voters that of course we're the party of small government just look at what we think we don't want people getting involved in other people's lives and i think that in that case that is where the republican party derives their uh their their message of small government in the sense that they target different areas of government to expand rather than democrats for example uh without making any sort of generalization i mean uh, a, a liberal democrat would like much more to become involved in uh say, social laws or, social, or laws which deal with social issues in America, whereas a Republican is going to be much more, uh, much less involved in things like this, but they're going to be incredibly in favor of military expansion. Um, all right, so uh, I guess that's all the time we have actually for today. Uh, with you, Henry, but I do want to ask you one last question and then we're going to go to break. Uh, 
so for my last question that I wanted to, I'm just really just curious here, kind of a little off topic here, but just curious. When we look at a government on free trade agreements around the globe, is that government being too big or is that government being smart? Uh, I would have to go with government being smart in cases like that. Uh, we see any number of problems in allowing corporations to trample across borders of both our nation and our allies and our business partners and essentially set up their own form of government in other nations based on their proprietary interests. So in that case, when it comes to trade agreements, when it comes to our nation uh, dealing with such things, uh, the government of the United States has always been involved when it comes to trade agreements and trade partnerships. This is one of the things that is advocated for in the Constitution for America and one of the things which was not provided for in the Articles of Confederation, the founding of the country, which which led directly into us allowing government to do this. So in this specific example, I would say that government uh, is and ought to be involved quite heavily when it comes to dealing with other countries, even in an economic sense. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. For calling in today, Henry. And uh, you'll definitely always be back on this show. Next up. We have one of my closest friends going to Harvard for economics, going to talk us talk to us about the size of government, and I just get the feeling we're going to disagree a little bit more than Henry and I just did. So uh, thank you very much, Henry, for coming on the show. This is Opinion Nation. We'll be right back after this break. individuals and businesses with tax problems listen carefully do you feel like you're losing control over your finances if you owe over ten thousand dollars in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns we can help you take back control the irs is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world and they can seize your bank account garnish your paycheck close your business and file criminal charges take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at tax mediation services and take advantage of the fresh start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment, reduce your payments by 30 to 50 percent, and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15 minute consultation. Call 800 826 1246. 800 826 1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. 
Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. All right, welcome back. I'm Bryce Robbins. This is Opinion Nation, and I am joined by a longtime friend, Roberto Ruiz Melendez. So, Roberto, how have you been, actually? Good morning, Bryce. I'm, I've been great. All right, so I love when Roberto comes on the show whenever he does. He's kind of like, uh, as our teacher would say, it, Haley's Comet passes every once in a while. So here's our once in a while, so let's glimpse him and his awe. Hello, Roberto, and first, let's tell people a little bit about you, give you some credit. You're going to Harvard for uh, economics, sure. correct? Yes, I am. All right, so clearly we have somebody who knows what they're talking about, and I can vow for him. He's brilliant when it comes to numbers, economics, and business in general. So, Roberto, the Thanks. size of government... No, no, don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> the size of government, where should it be? This is, I, I, it's a very broad question, I know, and it's almost a bad question, but the size yeah. of government, what role does the government play in our lives? I was just stating in my pre, in, uh, in the beginning of the show, I was listening to the guy from Turning Point USA. Um, uh, who, who, who specifically? Charlie Kirk? Yeah, Charlie Kirk, in his video, mm -hmm. is stating, mm -hmm. you know, we're sick of big government intervening in our lives. I sure. love to see big government interfere with my life, um, and most notably because I'm not gay, uh, but even that has changed. So tell me, where is the size of government? It, it, where well, should the optimal size of government? Sure. I think that the question you're asking is, is really comes down to what, what the point of a government is. Um, you know, to... To paraphrase Senator Ben Sass, when asked this question, he said um, a really great answer, which I would like to, to say now, and that is that government is not the giver of our rights. Government is a shared experiment that this country has created to protect our rights as individuals. Our rights do not come from government. Our rights come from our creator. Our rights come from the very nature that we are American. Right, so government exactly. does not, yeah, go ahead. But my point here is that I'm trying to get across, and I want your response on, is that it seems that when government is taking a more active role in our society, we are not turning Stalin-like, we are not turning you know, Hitler-like, we are not turning Mao-like, but our people are being lifted out of poverty. And that just seems to be the trend, and I want to know if you disagree with that, I guess. I, I, you know what, that, that question is really multifaceted, but to give you a kind of a straight answer, government can be very effective at times and can be very ineffective at times. It is a, it is a group um, that, that has come together so that they can merely protect, you know, provide for the common welfare, provide for the common good, protect our nation. Um, but there are times, you know, when government, for example, we can look at, Lyndon Johnson's famed war on poverty and how that was a, a beautiful, epic disaster um, of how we poured hundreds of millions of dollars, almost billions of dollars into fighting poverty and did absolutely nothing. The problem with government, and specifically with large government, is that large government, as designed by, by our founders, is not designed to be necessarily efficient. Large government the wheels of bureaucracy are meant to turn slowly, and that is to prevent factions and, and, and other unruly forces in our, in our country from taking over, um, you know, control of our government and passing their own dangerous ideals. So the now, wheels of bureaucracy turn slowly. So just, just let me finish this, this, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this yeah, one point really quickly. Yeah, please. This is, this, this is a problem with government. The government is inherently inefficient. You know, looking at something like the Department of Labor or, the, or, or, or the, you know, any kind of federal bureaucracy. Uh, I just came back from, from, from working in Washington, D.C., and I can tell you that to get a proposal into the Department of Labor for one aspect of a research project into how they operate, it'll take you eight months to get that proposal approved. Eight months. That's your proposal in the private sector. will take you 20 minutes. That's a problem. And that's not a problem we can fix 
by changing the government because that is the way the government was created, you know? Yes. So now I want to get into your expertise on this, and that is in relation to economics specifically. Sure. Should um, the government you know, it, have an yeah. active hand in the economy? Uh, you know, I think any government should have a, uh, a, 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 there is no, there is no economy that can run truly laissez-faire. That, that, that's a myth. You know, you can't, the invisible hand will come down and fix everything. That's, that, that does not exist. There is some government regulation that must exist. However, there is a point where government regulation will stifle growth. And I think that we've reached that point in this country. We've gone far beyond that point, actually. Um, but there is certainly a line in the sand where government can, you know, should stop interfering. And you can look, actually, the Heritage Foundation has an index called the Index of Economic Freedom, where mm -hmm. you can see um, how free certain economies are. And the United States is, I, I believe, is in the top 20 or, 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 but, you know, very low. I think it's uh, 13 or 14 or 15 in economic freedom. And the countries above us have been more prosperous because they provide their citizens with more economic freedom. But now, right? and <clears throat> economic, yeah. but, but now what, what I'm trying to, what I was trying to get at here is I'm talking about specific regulation of industries. So for example, I always hark on the coal industry, right? Sure. Uh, the clean power plan, for example, is debt is going to, if put into effect, effectively kill the coal industry. Does government have that right to do? I would argue yes, because I think coal is a threat to our, our human health. Does government have that right? The government, in the sense of coal, right? Let's, let's just take a look at coal. Um, I think that, that government interference there is actually unnecessary because the market is killing coal on its own. Um, coal is expensive now more than ever. Uh, coal is um, more dangerous now more than ever. So a lot of people are not interested anymore in using coal for coal power plants. And it's not, not what happened, it looks bad. So the market is doing it on its own. And Obama's clean power plan is merely expediting what the market already did. I, don't, I personally believe um, that when it comes to this um, plan, when it comes to the the ideals of um, the the clean power plan, that it's something that is necessary to prevent negative externalities, but the market is already doing that on its own. So, in right, essence, so I don't think it's completely sorry. necessary, right? It's not necessary. The clean power plan is not necessary because uh, the market is already acting on its own to fix that problem. Well, I would disagree with that with you on that because, as you stated, we're expediting the process, and the Earth needs to expedite the process of getting rid of coal. But, yeah, but, um, but, but, but the problem I want to move on to a different point with the clean power plant. All right, but I want to move on to a different point. Government mandate. I want to start continue. talking about. I want to start talking about the the banks in our country, and I want your sure. opinion on that because Dodd Frank is by and far the largest. Uh, financial reform bill in this country's history uh, since the Great sure. Depression. So, yeah. is is creating a, uh, a consumer protection bureau and is regulating the big banks to the point where you have the power to break them up in le written in legislation too far? Yes, uh, written in the, the big banks is an unnecessary diatribe. You know, told told by us by the left, and it's wrong. Because bringing up the big banks is an unnecessary tool to have for a federal government. And let me explain why. The president, the Fed, after the 2008 bank collapse, has these things called funeral plans in case one of the major banks or two or three or four of the major U.S. banks were to fail, which is not going to happen. Not only that, when you break up the big banks, you affect the liquidity of capital in the market, right? So there's not enough money to go around. And... Mm -hmm. That breaking up of the big banks negatively affects the economy. On top of that, right, those big banks need to have the ability to act autonomously in the sense that their actions, while they may have been, you know, wanton before the 2008 financial collapse, were not something that I, that I personally believe the government should be interfering with. But Only why? in the sense of the, yeah, go ahead. Why, why, when the whole issue 
was that these banks were so big and then they collapsed in 2008. Now they're about 11 times bigger than they were in 2008. Don't you see that as an inherent flaw that we're almost putting all our eggs in a basket? No, because that's not how the economy works. Um, so the, the problem, the problem with you know saying, oh, these banks are way too big. We should break up the banks. That would affect nothing because the real issue with the banks is that, and they are still allowed to take consumer saving money and gamble with it on in the stock market. There's something called Glass Steagall, which would prevent that. But when reinstating Glass Steagall would be essential. Which would be essentially breaking up the big banks. The problem is that that is how good banks make their money. They go out and they give out loans and they give out investments with customers' money. That's how the banking system has always worked in this country. Okay, yeah. So, in the sense that breaking them up the big banks, you're going to be breaking up the very industry that has helped foster the United States into one of the most uh, into one of the most innovative economies in the world. There are very few other countries where you can go and get a loan for the interest rate that we have here. That's why there's so much innovation in this country. So, so let me ask you this. Cycle that. Yeah. Would, would you then be opposed to a new, as Hillary Clinton put it, new reformed Glass-Steagall? I, you know what? I would have to, I, I, I can't give my opinion on something I, I, I haven't read or I don't know anything about. That's fair I mean, enough. That's fair enough. A, fair enough. A, a, um, a, a new reformed Glass-Steagall might be something I could, I, I, I could get behind, but, you know, it, in the sense that, uh, the old glass Steagall, I cannot get behind that. You cannot explain. Explain to no, our listeners why why that is something that you cannot get behind. So glass Steagall would essentially allow the essentially allows banks in this country would disallow banks in this country from using customer saving money on the stock market through investments. Um, but industries rely that on that investment. So industries rely on that investment to innovate, right? So an industry like Apple might take, might be invested in by Citibank, and all the money that they get from Citibank would, would be customer money. So that is, you know, something that that is being given by the bank to Apple. And that's very important for innovation in this country. Well, you know, in all reality, it, it, it seems a little ridiculous that government can. Uh, or not government, excuse me, the banks can gamble your money, so to speak, um, without you <laughs> without you even knowing. Uh, but I guess that's the risk you take when you give your money exactly. to the banks. I mean, you're more than welcome <laughs> to put your money under a mask. I, I guess so, but it seems that there should be some sort of regulation that would uh, almost prevent that, that type of there action. Is, there, but, is, there, is, there is the Federal Reserve Bank, and they have their... It, they have their plans, you know. You know, this it wasn't that. supposed to go this way. It was supposed to be me arguing for big government, not arguing for the smaller government. But it seems that we turned sides there. Um, yeah. Now, let me ask you this, and 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 this is a, a big topic that I really, I think, a lot of listeners want to know about in relation to social security, and sure. then I want to get into relationship to wages. But first, social security. In my eyes, Social Security has lifted millions upon millions of people out of poverty since its inception. And I understand that there are problems with it, that there was just a report that came out. It's going to run out by, what, like 2034, but then that was Mm -hmm. proven. It said not entirely, whatever. Obviously, the system needs reform. But do you think government taking action to create a system like Social Security is government overstep? You know what? My, my belief with Social Security mm-hmm. is that you should be able to opt out of Social Security. But that clearly would be able to, because then there wouldn't be money for everybody. That's the whole problem, is that we already don't have enough money in the system. Yeah, but that's, but that's, but that's, that's a matter of personal responsibility, man, to, to, be, to be very honest with you. It, you know, the government is not as, as good as an investor as, as, as you could possibly be. So... This, this ideal that the government should be investing for you, I think it's flawed because this is a country of personal responsibility. And if you want to save up for retirement, then at the age 20, you should start your own annuity or your own IRA. And from there, grow your money over time. Social Security, on the other hand, takes money from you and gives it back to you in time at a very low, you know, with, with a very low benefit. You could, you could, you know, quadruple that money if you're an effective um, investor. 
So, so the then people, what, so wait, let, me, let me ask you this. Yeah. What, what happens when somebody invests all their money and we, what we were just talking about where the bank gambled your money away? Well, you see, in that case, that's, that's the risk you run. So that's a risky um, run, but government is supposed to be the secure run. I mean, I, we're no, because the problem with that is that now people are relying on a government program that is going to become insolvent um, to to protect them, and that's just something that that we that is not viable Roberto, in this nation. Roberto, yes, Social Security lifted twenty one million Americans out of poverty. And sure. the system continues to keep people afloat. I'm not saying it's working perfectly. I think in my eyes, it should really be a pay it for yourself system so that the money you pay is there for you, uh, not funding the generation that came before you. I think that's silly and that's yeah. how we run out of money. And I think that's the track we're well, going on. I think we need an overhaul. That wouldn't work because you need to, because the, the, the fact of the matter is social security has been rated so many times that, the people <clears throat> that we're paying for the generation above us. Well, exactly. That's, so, that's my problem. Well, those, exactly. That's not going to work. That shouldn't work. It needs to be reformed. Because oh, frankly... No, I, I'm not exactly. disagreeing so, with you, but I'm saying that your method of giving it privately to people to go invest is far riskier if we're if our goal it is, is it's, to keep it's people their prerogative. It's their prerogative. If you want to, you can, you should be able to say, I'm going to stay in social security and if the market crashes, then I'll still have my money. Or you can say, I'm going to risk it, take my money out and go into the stock market. That's, that's their prerogative. They should be able to do that. This is a country of individual, of individual liberty. If you're going to take your money out, out of social security and then social security falls apart, I mean, I mean, and then your account falls apart because of an economic collapse. Too bad. See, that's you, the problem. When you, when you say too bad very easily, but when I hear too bad, I see people starving and you no know, people without that's, any that's, money. And that's their, their own home. fault. And that's, and that's their own fault. It's, it's the same argument that I would make for a taxi driver that decided to join the taxi industry right before Uber came along. You screwed up. You made a mistake. And now you're going to have to pay the consequences. Sorry. Yeah, well, the consequences could be you're out of your house. So anyways, I, now I want to get to wages. I want to get to wages. That's the risk you run. I want to get to wages. With wages. And this is a topic that people are very interested in because this could affect millions of people. Should the government have a role at all in setting a wage? Um, see, a government minimum wage is something that... Um, now, you know, this is a really complex question we, when you look at it. If I were to give you one answer, it would be maybe, kind of. I can't give you a direct answer because there's just so many moving parts to that. Um, well, I mean, elaborate on the sense that should government have any control? Some people will tell you straight up, no, government should not have any it, control over wages. It should be the, for the, the market at work. Yeah, because, well, because theoretically the way that, that wages are supposed to work is that, you know, like, as wages, as, as prices go up, wages go up, but that's not happening, right? Because that, that, there's a seven-year gap in between those two. So as prices go up, prices will go up first, and then wages will kind of sway way behind that, um, which, which is a problem, a big problem. Um, so that might be a place where the minimum wage comes into, comes into effect um, and allows people to earn uh, a, a, a standard living. However, the minimum wage, here's, here's the point. You can have a minimum wage, but the minimum wage was never intended to be a livable wage, right? The minimum mm -hmm. wage was not intended to be $15 an hour because that, is, uh, that number will stifle economic growth, especially for people our age, because of the fact that we will not be hired at that price. We are not worth $15 an hour. That is not, we are unskilled workers. And now let me ask you this though, because because yeah. I I look at uh, like Costco for example, and I know this is sure. this is in relation to a big company, not a small business. Yeah, this yeah. is a big company, but mm -hmm. they are doing well, and they are paying their workers a lot. Twenty one dollars yeah. an hour is the base pay for somebody starting at sure. Costco. I read. You know, yeah, and Costco and Costco has developed their business model 
to be able to 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 sustain that um you know level of of, of wage. You know, Costco Costco is very they run besides wages, they run a very, very thin G and A ship. Like general and, and, and administrative costs. Like for example, the Costco CEOs don't have don't have a private jet. They they fly on they, they they fly coach, right? Costco sure. executives don't have a huge headquarters. They they, they operate out of a warehouse. Uh, Costco can keep its its expenses down and be able to you know pay their pay their workers that much, and that's their ideal. But on a macro economy scale, you you're not going to be able to do that because Sunny's Pizzeria down the block from both of us, right? Mm-hmm. When when we say it's going to be fifteen dollars an hour, right? They're going to lay off two of their workers, or they're going to have to start charging twenty dollars for a pie of pizza. And who is that going to kill? Sunny's because Domino's down the street will just be able to change their system, put in some kiosks, use technology to their advantage, right? And yeah, Domino's no will be able to innovate faster than Sunny. Sunny will go out of business and Domino's will be eating crappy pizza for the rest of our lives because we won't be able to have Sunny. Well, I'd also say Sunny is eating crappy way. pizza too, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, come but, on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, my, but I, I want to get to this now. So Donald Trump actually just came out in support of a $10 minimum wage. Yeah, and that's why I'm not voting for him. That's <laughs> interesting. And that's why I'm not I mean, I mean and, and, and the funny thing is I'm voting for Clinton, but, but the really funny thing is that Donald Trump, and I, and I really want to make this point, will make our government so much larger than Clinton now. Uh, that's what I was just saying with Henry. But now I want, I want to ask yeah. this. So we look at a company, and I don't want to talk about small businesses because that's we could go on for hours about how we could – potentially fluctuate minimum wages in brackets. And I read this. I love this idea. You fluctuate the minimum wage in a bracket based on the company you work for. So a smaller business pays smaller. Uh, minimum wage, that's, larger businesses, it, it fluctuates, brackets. But, for example... That, that could work. That could. Um, yeah. But, for example, with Walmart, they just raised their base pay to $10 an hour. Yeah, they could do that because they have so much money. But, my problem is, is that when Walmart is the number one employer in America, it is disgusting sure. that the Waltons are making $50 billion a year each, and their employers are taking $6 billion from, uh, from uh, government handouts because they can't afford to live while working for Walmart. That's, that is ridiculous. Now, and what do you think about government's yeah. intervention into that issue? And that's what I'm really trying to get at here with the wage issue. Oh, so you mean like, yeah, the, the, the activation that Walmart's a welfare queen. You know, yeah, I, I think that, to, to be very honest with you, um, the notion that Walmart is this, it's this enormous welfare queen is, has, some, has some validity to it, which is true, because of the fact. They're taking $6.2 billion dollars a year from our... Yes. Okay, yeah, hold on. Good. That is not Walmart's fault. Walmart Explain. is paying, paying workers what it can pay them, right? So Walmart's paying workers what it has decided to pay them to sustain its growth. And yes, the Waltons earn a you're telling very me, you're large telling amount me that of you, money. You, they could probably, yes, they could probably afford to to pay more for... Um, to, to pay their workers more. This is true. At the same time, the Walton is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a business, and they have, you know, they have their right to, to charge whatever they want, uh, and to pay their workers what they want to pay their workers, and then to go home and and, and reap the benefits of their hard work. Right? Roberto, they built they, that company. The they six Waltons together are worth one hundred and forty-eight point eight billion dollars. Yeah, and they built the company. They built I understand Walmart. that. They I understand that. Money. But their people, their people, their workers are literally clinching to welfare to stay afloat. That's what those workers are worth. Those workers are worth ten dollars an hour. I would disagree with that. I think when the company's no, worth more, the workers are worth more, and because not who's, necessarily. Who's there every day? It's the workers that are on the floor every day. And this is what I hate about our system. 
This is what I hate about here's, our system. Here's the problem. It doesn't make sense. Here's the problem. You, yeah. I don't, you know, the market, and I personally don't think the guy greeting you when you walk into Walmart, hi, welcome to Walmart, is worth $15 an hour. Well, when he's, he's making the com when he's contributing to the company that's worth billions of dollars a year, he's worth a little bit more than the bare minimum. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, sure. We're that's why we pay ten dollars an hour, you know. Anyways, Roberto, you know it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. You're gonna be back on. I love to argue with you and drive you nuts. Um, but uh, you know, have a good one, bud, and uh, we'll keep in touch soon. Uh, yes, sir. All right, I'll talk today. to you later. All Good right, luck. so as I wind down the show in our last minute left, uh, I do want to say that thank you, everybody, for listening to our show today. A good number of you uh, were listening and responding and reaching out. But the real quintessential question that I want to ask, the, the pivotal question of the show for you, the listener, is what is the ideal size of government? Now, when I, the way I see it is that when government not necessarily expands inefficiently, that's bad. But when government takes a, a driving role, they're not adhering, or for the most part, not adhering to shareholders, unless, you know, you, we want to look since Citizens United. I, I guess I could yield that argument there. But um, does government have a role to play in getting people out of poverty? Does government have a role to play in keeping people afloat? Is a bigger, more active government going to be better for our society in healthcare, the environment, in education. What is the scope of government? And we could go on forever talking. We didn't even start talking about education. We didn't even talk about the military. So, you know, we have a long way to continue this discussion. But for now, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed today's episode. And we'll be back next week for another installment of my favorite program, Opinionation. But until now, until then, have yourself a great week. I'm Bryce Robbins. This is Opinion Nation. I'll see you next week. Welcome to Opinion Nation. What makes us Americans is our shared commitment to an ideal that all of us are created I, too, am American.